I want to continue sharing on the subject of culture and specifically a culture of humility, a culture of humility. What does humility look like? What does humility sound like? And it's so important that the church be a house of humility versus, versus pride. Pride is very deadly and dangerous in our hearts, in our homes, in our churches, and in our society. And we must be that counterculture, if you will, of humility. And what does that mean? And what does that look like in our lives? In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, the scriptures teach that Jesus, who was God among us, was meek or humble. God is humble. He's a humble God. Humility is God's nature and character developed in our lives. And so I don't know if we can even fathom the humility that Jesus clothed himself in, who was God, the second member of the Godhead. And he laid aside all his glory and all of, of heaven's heaven's treasures and glory, and he became a human being. I don't know if you can wrap your mind around that kind of humility that God became one of us. He identified with us, our suffering, our weakness, all, all of our issues in life. And even in his first appearing, it was so humble. Jesus, God made flesh, was born in a barn. <laughs> it just doesn't get any more humble than that. Not only was he humble, he humbled himself. Philippians chapter two says that he humbled himself under the mighty hand of God and he became obedient to the Father God even unto death and the cross. And because he humbled himself in that way, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name that at the sound of the name of Jesus, kneecaps bust in heaven, kneecaps bust in the earth, and kneecaps bust under the earth, and every tongue eventually will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Amen. Come, somebody give Jesus praise. Again, why does Jesus as a man have the highest seat in the cosmos? Because as a man, he humbled himself even unto death, a horrific death for you and I, for our sins, to make an atonement, to extend God's righteousness by faith to us and his complete forgiveness. And so we need to learn from Jesus who modeled humility. In Numbers chapter 12, verse three, the Bible says that Moses was the most meek or humble man on the face of the earth. Moses was the most humble man on the planet who wrote Numbers, the book of Numbers. Moses wrote Moses wrote in the Bible, Moses, the most humble man on the whole planet. How can you write in an eternal book, you're the most humble man on the planet and still be humble? <laughs> maybe humility and being humble means something than we thought it meant. And maybe you can know if you're humble. Maybe you can know if you have pride in your life and you can deal with pride in your life because there's many things that we should be learning and seeing by revelation during pride month. God has been merciful not only to record in the Bible the dangers of pride and give us pictures of how pride leads to destruction. We can now see it. Our young people can see the danger of pride and the destruction of pride, not only in the human heart, but in the entire culture. And so there's many lessons we need to learn from Pride Month. And I will be teaching in the future on lessons to be learned on God's awareness of the difference between pride and humility and the how we have to be a people of humility because one of the most horrible sins on the planet, listen, is religious pride. While we need to see the pride in our culture and be the counterculture to it and stand up in love against things that are destructive to our children especially, we cannot counter pride in the culture with pride in our hearts and pride in our midst. We have to learn what pride is and judge our own hearts, judge our own homes, judge our own churches, judge ourselves so that we will not be ultimately judged with the world. And again, while I'm sounding the alarm in the love of God as best I know how, the church is still asleep at large and at slumber when it comes to an awareness of what's going on in our generation and especially to our children and the protecting of our children. During Pride Month, 
there was a major rally in which the chant of the entire, entire rally was, we are here, we are queer, and we're coming after your children. If we can't see and we don't have eyes to see where this is going according to the Bible and now according to our culture, then we're still asleep and we need to wake up. We need to understand that pure love, God's love, protects our children from sexual perversion, protects our children in their moral innocence, protects an agenda that is grooming children for human trafficking that's very, very real, from pedophilia that's very, very real, from all these perversions and corrupting their minds at a young age. They must be protected. And while I must stand for our children and protect our children and build a sanctuary of safety for our children, I can't. And you can't and we can't be self-righteous and have any pride in our hearts even as we're trying to counter the pride in our culture. We need to repent ourselves from pride in our hearts or pride in our midst. We need to be quick to diagnose pride and realize, wait a minute, that's a form of pride in my own heart. And I need to be far removed from that. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy for me and for your love for me and help me overcome pride now and humble myself under the mighty hand of God. Last week, I shared with you how I had a vision of Durant becoming a sanctuary city for Jesus and for children. And this week in prayer, I had another vision and I'm processing it. I probably shouldn't share it. I try to process things before I go public. But I literally saw Durant, downtown Durant, with Christian flags all the way down the center of our town. With Christian flags hanging on our businesses, with Christian flags in our schools and, and being raised on the poles at our schools, with Christian stickers in our businesses, and that we declare the month of June, Jesus is Lord. It is humble month. It's humble month. We as a city need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt us in due time. We need to not be embarrassed of the cross. We don't need to be embarrassed of our symbols and, and banners and, and celebrate an entire month and call it humble month. I believe God showed me this and that he's calling us to make a stand. He's calling us to be the counterculture and that for an entire month, we encourage people to get in churches that are preaching the word. For an entire month, we teach our people, what does humility look like? What is pride and the danger of pride? And we need to celebrate Jesus as Lord because Jesus is Lord, whether you believe it or not, whether you confess him as Lord or not, he is Lord. And we need to celebrate a whole month of a humble God, a whole month of learning how to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And so I'll be bringing that to you before next year's June and how to prepare our children better. Humility is God's nature in man. It's God's image in man. Man is created in the image and in the likeness of God, and God is humble. And because of Adam's sin in the garden and all of us being born into sin, pride is the nature of our flesh that is self-destructive. And humility must be taught. Humility must be understood by revelation, and we must choose daily to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Humility, again, is God's nature in man. It's God's image. Pride is Satan's work damaging God's image in man. Pride is what got Satan kicked out of heaven, saints. It is original sin. Satan's sin that was found in him when he was created an angel and called Lucifer, there was iniquity found in him. God didn't create sin. He created Lucifer and he was a angel of God and iniquity was found in him and he became Satan through pride. It's pride that got him kicked out of heaven. It's original sin. And what was it? Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 14 Lucifer said, I will exalt my throne above the most high God. 
I will be like God. I will be God independent of God. I can be good, and I don't need God. I can be independent of God and I can know good, I can do good, and I can be good. I can be like God without God in rebellion to God. And the opposite is true. When we rebel against God, when we rebel against God and his nature, we become anything but like God and we commit the sin of Isaiah 5:20 that says that we'll actually call good evil and we'll call evil good. We'll call light dark and we'll call literal darkness light. We'll call what is bitter sweet and what is sweet bitter. That's what happens in pride and what pride does to us. And Satan was the original author of pride. I've shared this before, but we have so many new people and now we've just gone on another station that is international and has the potential of 65 million viewers every day. Hallelujah. So God is blessing us immensely and we're reaching now millions of people. And so some of the things that I have to repeat people here for the first time and as a teenager, it really messed me up anytime the preacher would say that Satan got kicked out of heaven, Lucifer who became Satan, and many of the angels who became demons got kicked out of heaven. And what did he say that got him at odds with God? He said, I will be like God. And man, I would sit there and cringe because I'm thinking and looking around, isn't that why we're all here? Don't we all want to be like God? And of course, as a teenager, I'm freaking out a little bit because I had said many times, even to God, Lord, I just want to be like you. <laughs> okay, I know y'all have never said such things. <laughs> and so then the thought as a teenager would hit me, well, what's so bad about that? And is that wrong for me to say that? For a few years, there was this, this band that came out that people wore. It was a fad for a while that literally on your arm, you had this band and it said, what would Jesus do? And so you would look at that and you would go, well, in this situation, I wanna be like Jesus. Okay, y'all aren't getting this, I get it. And so I had to go to God, what is the problem here? See, the problem isn't wanting to be like God, the problem is thinking you can be like God without God. You can be like God in rebellion to God. You can know good and evil. God, don't you want me to know good and evil? But yeah, God wants to teach me good and evil because if I try to know good and evil by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I will prefer to everything good and glorify everything evil. That's the nature of man without God. That's what pride does. That's what Satan does through sin to the, to the human heart. And so it's not only Satan that committed this sin, but others have committed it. Listen to just some simple things about pride, and we could spend a whole series on pride. The Bible says pride goes before the fall and destruction, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride is one of the seven deadly sins that are recorded in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, where God says, there are six things, yea, seven that I hate. And then he lists seven things, and number one is a proud look. Notice that pride goes before a fall and destruction. If we celebrate pride, if we embrace pride, we embrace Satan's original sin and it leads to our fall and literal destruction. Pride is the source of all contention, Proverbs 13, 10. There's something I can tell you about you if you're a very contentious person, if you're filled with strife all the time and anger all the time and bitterness, then you are a very prideful person because only by pride comes contention. And I don't like that scripture any more than, than you or even the world because every time I get contentious with somebody, it is a sign of a pride in my heart that God wants me to deal with. In James chapter three, the Bible teaches where envy and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. Well, pride is the source of all strife and contention. And where there's this envy and this strife, 
the Bible says there's confusion and every evil work. Satan works on the highway, six lane highway of pride. Pride is a six lane highway paved to the devil's hell. And you and I need to get off of that highway anytime we find ourselves on it. Find the quickest off ramp we can find. Don't even get on the access road. Go the opposite direction of the highway of pride because only by pride comes all this contention, all this strife, and this confusion. If you can't see pride as the source of all the strife in the culture and now the confusion, everybody is confused. Why? Pride is the source of all this strife and on the wings of this strife comes every evil work. Not some evil works, not a little evil work, every single evil work. Let me define pride for you so we can deal with humility and a culture of humility again. I've already told you that pride is self-centeredness in its simplicity and you worship at the altar of me, myself, and I. That is pride. Humility is God-focused and others-minded. God-focused and others-minded. Listen carefully. Pride is independence from God. Pride is independence from God. In pride, you don't see your need for God. You don't seek God. You don't call upon the name of the Lord. You don't think you need God. Humility then is total dependency on God. A prideful person lives their life independent of God. They will chart their own life. They will define their own identity. They will define their own definition of good and evil. They will chart their destiny, not realizing the destiny they will end at. Dependency is believing God to chart my life and my destiny, hallelujah. It's total dependency upon God. This is why it's so important that as a church and as a Christian, you understand how to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. What's that mean? How do I do that? I see my need for God. Why are so many called, but so few chosen? Have you ever thought about that? Jesus said many are called, but only a few are chosen. We misunderstand that many times and act like God's doing the choosing. No, God has called all of us. Jesus has died for every one of us. He atoned for the sins of the whole world. He died as much for people who don't know him as all of us that do know him. But why did we get chosen? Because we humbled ourselves and received of the amazing grace of God. Why don't a lot of rich people get saved? Why do more pe poor people seem to get saved than rich people? There are some rich people that can humble themselves and see their need for God, but most rich people get stuck in their pride and they don't see their need for God. I don't need God. I can pay for anything I need. I can buy anything I need. How many of you know you can't buy your way into heaven? No matter how much money you have, if you gain the whole world and lose your soul, what did you gain? But why don't many rich people get saved? Pride. Why do the poor seem to respond to the gospel and get saved? Because we see our need for God. Amen or oh me. Why do the famous, not many of them get saved? Jesus died for all these famous people that have all this fame and fortune. Why do so few of them get saved? Pride. Why do those that know we're born losers get saved? Because we see our need for God and we can humble ourselves. And on and on I can go with pride is what keeps people out of the kingdom and humility is what opens the door for salvation and all God's blessings in your life and his amazing grace. And once we receive of the grace of God, we can choose every day to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt us in due season. We don't have to have pride in our heart when we understand it and we can be truly a culture of of humility. And so again, pride is independence from God. And let me just encourage you, Pride Month did not start in recent history. Pride Month started in the garden 
with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent with the same sin of pride that got Satan himself kicked out of heaven. He reproduced the sin of pride in Eve and then Adam. When, when the serpent came to Eve and tempted her with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she said, God said, we, we should not eat of that tree. And if we do eat of it, we'll surely die. And the devil said, hath God said, listen to everything in the culture. I'll tell you what the Bible says and the six o'clock news will go, hath God said? I'll tell you what the Bible says and there'll be entire rallies that'll say, hath God said? Yeah, God hath said. And what God has said, let God be true and every man a liar. If God says it, it's settled. But not in pride. Pride always says and is tempted with hath God said. Then the devil said to Eve, you'll not die. You won't die. So the devil questions what God says, his word that's final authority. Then he tells you an outright lie. That you can disobey God and live. You can go your own way and live. You can identify and self-identify with whatever you want to and be happy and fulfilled and on and on we could go. You can live in immorality and be happy and joyful and fulfilled. No, God says the wages of sin is death. That it comes to steal on the wings of Satan himself and kill and destroy. And so we need to be quick to repent. A humble person repents. A prideful person celebrates their sin. That's how you can know the difference between pride and humility. And so Eve, after she's tempted of the devil, she looked at the tree and saw that it was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and one desired to make one wise. Because the devil told her, if you eat of that tree, you will be as God, knowing good and evil. And so the original sin that he committed in heaven, he reproduced in the garden, is I can be like God without God. I can know good and evil. Don't tell me what's right and wrong. Don't tell me what's moral and immoral. I have my truth, you have your truth. I'm here to tell you I don't have truth and you don't have truth. All we have is Jesus Christ, the truth the way, and the life. None of us after the flesh are right with God and can be right with God. We all need God. None of us can know good and evil, do good and evil. Well, do good and not evil. Independent, independent of God. And so that's important. The Pharisees, their sin was religious sin, religious pride. They missed their Messiah saints because of religious pride. They could not humble themselves. And in their pride, their eyes were blinded, their heart was hardened, and they missed the visitation of their Messiah. We don't wanna miss the visitation of Messiah in this third great awakening because of religious pride, self-righteousness. And so we have to recognize this in our hearts and be quick to repent. So let's talk about some attributes of humility. Attributes of humility. An attribute is what makes something what it is. An attribute of a ball is it's round. If it's not round, it's not a ball. Uh, you can call it a ball, but if it's not round, it's not a ball because that's an attribute of a ball. There are attributes of humility just like there's attributes of pride. And so what are the attributes of humility? Let me review one that I covered last week in a little more detail, and that is submission to God. Submission to God is an attribute of humility. How can I, like Moses, know I'm humble? How can you, like Moses, know if you're humble? You'll have a submissive heart. You'll learn to submit to God that a humble person believes God's word is absolute truth and that it is final authority and submits to it. And so we learn to submit to God. James chapter four says, God gives more grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Why does God resist the proud? Because pride reminds him of Satan, original sin. And he will resist us even as Christians in pride. And so 
God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Then it says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. James chapter 4, verse 7. So a part of humility is submission to godly authority. We have to learn to train our children to submit to their parents. That's why any school that hides any agenda from a parent should be disciplined and you should take your children out immediately if they're telling your children things and keeping them from you. It doesn't take a village to raise our children. It takes a mom and a dad to raise our children. We don't need Joe Biden raising our kids. We don't need school boards raising our kids. We don't need these corrupt politicians raising our kids and telling us how to raise kids. We need our schools to teach reading and writing and arithmetic and science and, and, and pure history of, of the nation. We're graduating young people from college that can't sign their diplomas. Why? Our schools are propaganda machines filled with teachings that have nothing to do with educating a child on how to prosper in a career in life. I will teach you how to teach your children and you need to teach your children morals. You need to teach your children when you find it appropriate to understand their sexuality. My God, some of you are in your 40s and you don't understand your sexuality yet. <laughs> Can't explain to a, an eight-year-old their sexuality yeah. and their identity. Am I the only one that has raised four of those booger heads? They didn't know come here from Sikkim till they got into their 20s and the jury is still out on that. <laughs> they changed who they were a hundred times. They woke up, I'm gonna be a fireman. The next day I'm gonna be a policeman. Jeremy blessed me so much as a kid. We'd talk to him, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Man, my heart still warms over this. I've never said it publicly. I don't wanna embarrass him, but it just came to me. And he said, Daddy, I just wanna be a Christian daddy when I grow up, hallelujah. <laughs> Woo, I like that one. My God, I was so confused into my uh, late 20s over my sexuality and, and issues. And, and when I was a kid, I wanted to be so many different things. For a long time, I thought I was Superman. I walked around with a cape all the time. Thank God no one surgically attached it to me or I might be Elvis today, hallelujah. <laughs> Half of us thought we were Elvis and wished we were. Well, that young people can't even identify with that. We all go through identity confusion. That's why God gave us parents. That's why God gave us spiritual authorities. And yet, you will buck many of your spiritual authorities that labor among you, that love you, that have proven themselves to you, and you'll question them. <laughs> that was pride right there, buddy. <laughs> I dare you mess with me, water bottle. I am so sorry if that hits you. <laughs> Where was I before I got on track? Spiritual, I knew that, I was testing y'all, thank you. <laughs> Spiritual authorities, yet yeah, you'll believe the six o'clock news. You'll believe people rallying because the numbers look so big that everybody thinks this way and you won't submit to spiritual authorities. Your children can't be successful if we don't teach them early to submit to God. Their destiny is wrapped up in God. God has a plan for their lives and it's a good plan. It's a beautiful plan. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful, pleasurable plan that God has for their lives and you have to introduce them to it, to it early. And, and we have to be taught God's nature and character of humility, that they have to learn to submit to you as their parents, or they're gonna have a hard time in life. They have to learn to submit to police officers. I, I believe there are corrupt police officers and that that needs to be dealt with. And in a city like ours, we can deal with it because there's enough of us in this city to do the right thing the right way to make sure we don't have corrupt cops in our police department, because I'm here to tell you cops despise corrupt cops more than you and I despise corrupt cops. And one of the things that of many during the Black Lives Matter movement that was outright lies was how that policemen at large get up and, 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 and cruise the streets looking for black people to kill them. 
going out of their way to kill, especially black men. And if they can't kill them, they're going to lock them up. And I was told by on a stage with Christians, supposedly, that jails are nothing more than present day slavery. Man, we are confused. We are deceived and we got to wake up. And these young people were being taught and they were lamenting the older people that our young people have to be taught how to relate to a cop. As if corrupt cops are respecter of persons. I experienced at 12 years old one of the most horrifying encounters with cops that messed me up for a long time with corrupt cops. And I was 12 years old, 12 years old. And there was a lady on the street over from us, an elderly lady that had been accosted and raped. And I was seen in the neighborhood and they surrounded my house. My parents weren't there. And they began to harass me and to try to get me to confess to rape. Saints, I know a 12 year old today probably knows what rape is, but I didn't even know what rape was. And I was raised in Orlando, Florida, and we had all these ponds all around us and lakes and sinkholes. And so I was looking for a boat uh, in my area. Boats were everywhere. And a lot of people would have these old little boats that they were, didn't, didn't use anymore. So I was walking through the neighborhood and I was looking in the neighborhood. I was looking for an old boat and I was going to go up to the door and ask them how much they'd pay me to haul that boat off. <laughs> Capitalism, brother. <laughs> and so I had been seen. Well, these policemen were trying to get me to confess to raping this lady and beating up an old lady. And they did everything but handcuff me. They threatened to handcuff me. They threatened to take me and put me in jail. My parents weren't there. There wasn't a lawyer present. It traumatized me. It was the first time in my upbringing that I saw my dad, a side of my dad I had never seen. And my dad wasn't saved, but he was a good man. And he lit in the middle of them and threatened to sue them. And my dad was actually friends with the chief of police. And so the chief of police wound up chiding these cops and getting on to them. And to this day, when I'm driving down the road and I see those pretty lights flashing, <laughs> my first thought it in Christmas, I still feel that. So I get it when we are assaulted and abused by spiritual and natural authorities. And we must make a stand in situations like this. But I taught my children from the age of, of probably eight how to relate to a policeman. That's an authority still. You don't argue with them. You don't assault them verbally. You don't try to take their gun. <laughs> yeah, but what if they are abusive and you submit and I promise you, I will do something about it as your parent. Our church would do something about it. If one of you got unjustly treated by a policeman, we'd be right down to the police department and we would hold them lovingly accountable. There's ways to deal with this other than the way the culture is trying to deal with it. My point is we have to all learn to submit to authorities and when not to submit, and how to not submit properly. Amen or oh me. Amen. This is powerful. And our children need to be taught this. They need to understand this. A sign of humility is submission to God, submission to authorities. I've been in multiple jails. Jails are filled with people that never learn to submit to God, never learn to submit to their parents, never learn to submit to law officers. We need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt us in due season. Man, I should have got a standing ovation. No, no. That's a welfare clap. I don't want it. The point I'm trying to make is, are we prideful, independent of God, or are we humble, totally dependent upon God? What does that look like? It looks like submission to God, submission to his word, submission to the elders that love us and care about us. Number two, a humble person is teachable, teachable. One of the things that made Moses one of the most humble men on the planet 
is listen to me, dear ones. This man was not born again. He was not filled with the Holy Spirit like we are. The new covenant had not come yet. But this man trusted God and submitted to God in ways that's profound when you think of how teachable he was before God. This is really important. In Romans chapter 12, verse two, we all are familiar with how to be transformed, that we have to be transformed. Be not conformed. See, I don't know what Bible people aren't reading. Be not conformed to this world. Don't be shaped like them. Don't think like them. Don't act like them. Be not conformed. Don't let them pour you into a mold. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. Now listen, you have never had your mind renewed, listen, until you were corrected. Think about it. Every time you've repented, changed your mind and your direction, that's what repent means. That's how transformation comes into the Christian life. You were corrected. You received correction. You were thinking one way or living one way and you realize that's independent of God. And you realize, wait a minute, this is God's way. This is God's thoughts. And you changed your mind, you received correction. A humble person receives correction. Someone who is prideful, you can't correct them over anything. As a matter of fact, the Bible warns you of correcting a scornful man, a prideful man. You'll get a black eye. Prideful people will not receive correction. They're never, ever wrong. You can't tell them they're wrong. So what is humility? Humility is receiving correction. And man, this took me a while. The things I'm teaching you are not just doctrinal. You don't get them just when you understand the doctrine of it. You have to live it. And I wanted to be humble and I knew the importance of humility early in the ministry. And I thought I had to receive correction from everybody. And I had people jumping on me, rebuking me, falsely accusing me, condemning me, trying to shame me. My favorite one was when someone jumped on me and said, brother, I don't believe we should judge. <laughs> so you're judging me <laughs> for judging. We're all judging. We better just make sure we judge righteously and we judge nothing by appearance, but that we make righteous judgments. And so people were jumping on me and I would try to receive correction and the Lord showed me, now listen, this is important. We can only receive correction from people that love us. That's why you have to build relationships that are healthy and that are for real. And that there's people in your life that love you. Because when we correct someone or someone is correcting us, it has to come out of a love for us. And here I am receiving all these things from people who don't know me, don't love me, don't care for me. My son, Proverbs chapter three, my son despised not the chastening of the Lord or correction from him for whom the Lord loveth or corrects, he chastens. Why is God? <laughs> able to correct me over anything because he loves me more than anybody. Why does Sue get to correct me every day? <laughs> because I know she loves me and she's not correcting me from a self-righteous position, from a, from a condescending position, from an arrogant position, but because she really cares about me and loves me. Why did I correct my children? I never corrected them in anger. I never punished them. I did correct them. I did discipline them. But why did I do it? How did I do it? Because I loved them. I didn't do it out of selfishness and you just angered me and you violated my space and I missed that touchdown. Bend over. <laughs> That's stupid. No, when I disciplined them, it was because I cared for them. I cared about their future. I cared about their success. I knew that without correction, they could not be humble. And that a part of learning humility is being corrected. And you need to learn to receive correction from those that love you. Man, I don't receive in these meetings I do, people coming and jumping on me, having no idea what they're talking about. If they would just listen to me for a month, they would see the error of their correction. <laughs> that I don't even believe what you're accusing me of. And if taught the opposite, 
And so this is important, and I wish I could spend more time on it, but here's the one I want to get to. The next one, what does humility look like? It's dependency on God. Now let's go to, oh my goodness, I did it again. Let's go to, I was going to go to two scriptures that I wanted to elaborate on that I didn't have time last week, and I'm now committing the same transgression. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And let's talk about dependency. Dependency on God. A humble person admits and submits their weaknesses to God. Human weaknesses. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I've already read the context to you last week, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Why did God put this treasure, Jesus Christ, and God's very righteousness in a earthen vessel? That while my spirit is born again and my spirit is made righteous and truly holy and my spirit is united to Christ, can I get a witness because I'm running out of time that Jesus is the treasure that's on the inside of you, the hope of all glory? Amen. He's a treasure, but he's in an earthen vessel. Earthen there, natural. Vessel there literally means clay pot. A clay, a clay pot. The picture is God has put this treasure, Jesus Christ, and his very righteousness on the inside of your spirit, but you still have this earthen vessel, your flesh. And we're like clay pots. And can I get a witness that clay pots are easily broken? No? If you understood clay pots, you would know how you have to be gentle with them and they're easily broken. They can be smashed to pieces. They can be easily cracked. What Paul is basically saying is we're just a bunch of crack pots. <laughs> Every one of us have human weaknesses. Every one of us can be cracked easily. Every one of us can be broken. And I struggled with this, like I shared last week, with I really thought the longer I served Jesus, the stronger in my flesh I would be. The less dependency I would have on God. I actually, and I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I thought the, yeah, when you first get right with God, when I came back to God after the vision in May of 1980 of the cross, and man, I repented for walking away from God and my call, all those things. And I mean, grace hit me and an abundance of grace hit me. Man, it was so easy to be humble. I knew I didn't know anything that was productive. I knew I couldn't do the work of the ministry in human strength. I knew my weaknesses. But I thought my dependency upon God, in five years, I would be stronger and need him less. After 42 years, man, I barely need the Lord. I'm, I'm awesome. No, I'm as dependent on the Lord 42 years later as I was after the vision. I'm not any better in the flesh. I'm not any stronger in the flesh. The Bible says, let the weak say I am strong. He didn't say, let the weak say, I'm not weak anymore. I'm not weak anymore. No, the weak say I'm strong. Strong in what? Strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There is a place where you have to learn human weakness because 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says that God's strength, his power is made perfect in weakness. And so you just come to a place that you recognize when you're being tempted. Thank you, God. Because without you, I definitely would fall into that temptation. And without you, I would probably celebrate that temptation. See, this is a mystery to so many Christians. This is a mystery to some of you. You'll see somebody that's been serving the Lord for 30 years. And man, they're on the front row. Blessings on the front row. And they're pressing in and they're listening and they're growing and they're, they're leaders in the church. And then all of the sudden... They fall away and like they're doing things just like the world is doing them and in some cases worse. And it absolutely confuses the average Christian. How could that be? I don't mean to name names. I try to stay away from it. 
when I'm certain of something, I'll say a name, but I, I'm, I'm always cautious with names, even Joe Biden right now. <laughs> and so I try not to name these names, but there was a famous preacher that fell in the 80s. And I mean, so many Christians just got messed up. When Jimmy Swaggart, he was the leading evangelist of that hour. When he fell, I mean, there were Christians that quit church. There were Christians that thought, if that man can't serve God, if that man can't move on in God, if that man can't, then I can't make it anyway. And they would just give up. There were so many people disillusioned, not understanding that, listen, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel that all of us without God are weak. All of us without God. If I walked away from God today, I guarantee you I could be right back and worse than where I was in May of 1980 because of my flesh. We're weak. Boy, this is powerful. And why did God do that? It's like, why won't you just make me strong? Why can't it be let the strong say I'm weak no more? Hey Amen. Why isn't that written? Because see, if I could be strong, independent of God, I would think the power is of me and not of God. Yeah. I think some of you are getting it. That when you're tempted and you even fail, it's to remind you, you're nothing without God. But for the grace of God, you wouldn't be where you are. But for the grace of God, you wouldn't be serving God. But for the grace of God, it humbles you. It actually humbles you. And now I'm at a point where Paul talked about, I can glory in my weaknesses now. I can take pleasure in all these weaknesses. I told you last week when I got canceled on Facebook and a couple other social medias, there were a few minutes it bothered me. I just felt bad. It's like, oh man, what did I do now? And what did I say now? That I would get canceled and it just bothered me. And then it hit me. What a badge of honor that if these people are the deceivers I think they are and propagators of lies that I think they are, why would they not cancel me if I'm telling the truth? I need to take pleasure in infirmities, weaknesses, persecutions, reproach. I've even figured out how to get around the algorithms. I've got a bunch of signs. And instead of saying election fraud, I'm just going to hold up a sign that says election fraud. A big sign, vaccine mandates are the spirit of antichrist. <laughs> Just hold it up. You think that'll work? Yeah. I think that would be awesome. Maybe I'll bring signs next time I come and go, here's your sign. <laughs> that'll hit the older people only. Amen. We have to learn to humble ourselves. And that means dependency on God. Now I'm out of time. I've taught these in the past. And I think next year I'm going to do humility month. We're going to do humble month during the month of June. Amen. We're going to celebrate Jesus as Lord. We're going to have rallies in the streets where we repent of our sins. We call upon the name of the Lord and we receive our forgiveness and he heals our land humble month. We're going to practice humble month. And, and one of the things that marks humility, if you understand dependency by revelation, listen carefully, thanksgiving will surge your heart. I'm going to give you four things in closing. I've taught on these. When I do humble month, we might take each one each month on how to humble ourselves. Number one, you are nothing without God. That's offensive to pride. Pride thinks you're something and you don't need God. Humility goes, I am nothing without God. But because of God, my new identity in Christ Jesus, I'm the head, not the tail, above and not beneath, blessed coming in and blessed going out. I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. I'm a part of the seed of Abraham. I have an inheritance that's kept for me in heaven, and I have been given a name that at the name of Jesus, kneecaps bow, hallelujah. I can now do spiritual warfare because of the armor of God that's a gift to me. I am nothing without God, but I am everything now in Christ Jesus, hallelujah. That's humility. Humility finds your new identification in Christ and in the cross. Number two, number two, 
I have nothing without God. The prideful say, I have everything and don't need God. The humble say, I literally have nothing without God. I'll share this and pride will just surface out of so many people. And somebody will come up and say, well, wait a minute. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a genius. I have one of the highest IQs on the planet. Where'd you get it? I know your mom and dad, you didn't get it from them. <laughs> Jacob is a genius. He didn't get it from his mom. <laughs> you can tell Sue is not with me today. <laughs> and I'm not happy about it, hallelujah. I got an hour and a half sleep last night. I'm not even accountable for anything I've said today. <laughs> no, without God, we have nothing. But listen, with God, and true humility and grace, we have everything. We've been given everything freely, heaven itself. Number three, we know nothing. This is the most offensive, even at church, when I tell people, you know nothing independent of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2, the Bible says, if a man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought. For knowledge puffs up, but the love of God edifies. Carnal knowledge puffs people up. It produces pride. What does humility look like then? It says, everything I know is by the grace of God. That if it wasn't for God's grace, I love you, brothers and sisters, but every one of us would be in a field eating grass right now like an animal if it wasn't for the grace of God and him touching our brains even. God has given us the mind of Christ. It's in our spirit and we can renew this mind to that by the Holy Spirit. And the last one, number four, is I can do nothing without him. John chapter 15, verse five. See, people in pride will rear up when I say, you can do nothing without God. That's not true. I built this business and I'm a self-made man. Boy, that's pride. That where'd you get the wisdom? Where'd you get the ability? Where'd you get the knowledge? It all came from God. Where did you get the, the, the ability to create? That's the image of God in you. Everything we know comes from God. Even the carnal knowledge that we have that people get puffed up in, God gave us this knowledge. Did you know the laws of electricity were here in Jesus's day and they could have had artificial light in Jesus's day? Everybody understand that? Why didn't they have it? They didn't have the knowledge of it. This knowledge of the laws of electricity, they came from God in due season and due time for an eternal purpose of God and other laws and knowledge that without God puffs us up, but in God absolutely causes us to be thankful. Now I'm gonna close with this, last closing. If I believe I am nothing without God, then wouldn't I be thankful for everything I am in God? Wouldn't I just clap all the time? Wouldn't I just rejoice? Wouldn't I be in a church and say, start the praise music, I'm ready to thank God because without him, I know I am nothing, but I'm not without him, so now I'm a new creation. Thank you, God, thank you, God. If you believed everything you have came from God, wouldn't you be thankful? If you believe everything you know came from God, wouldn't you thank God for the knowledge you have? If you believe that everything you do that has an eternal value and blesses God and human lives, wouldn't you give God thanks? That's why Jubilee is such a powerful week where we all come before the Lord. We gather together corporately and we say, thank you for my new identity. Thank you for everything I have. Thank you for everything I know. And thank you for everything I can do by the amazing grace of God. Amen. Amen. Somebody give God thanks. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man. When you begin to humble yourself and see these things, praise is natural. Thanksgiving is natural. Celebrating the resurrection every week on Sunday becomes so natural that we owe Jesus everything. Amen. Amen. Well, were you blessed today? Amen. Amen. 
Father, I thank you for these precious people. I thank you for our children and for the new phase in Project Big of building a sanctuary for the city, for our children, a safe place for our children. Thank you, God, for our marriages. We have to understand these things or our marriages will collapse. Only by pride comes contention. Help us to be humble in our marriages. Help us to respect our spouses and to humble ourselves in our relationships. Thank you for our jobs, our careers, our ability to work, our ability to steal no more, but to work with our hands that which is good and give to people that are in need. Thank you that every one of us employed are serving our city and our community and we're putting back into the community instead of taking out. I, I declare full employment over this house and that those who need a job will find a job, a good job, and that that is a part of your grace in our lives. Thank you for saving our city, our state, and our nation. Thank you for allowing us to not despise small beginnings, but in this small town, we can be a part of the great awakening. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <laughs>